It's been almost 176 years since the United States ended its war and the invasion of Mexican territory. The Mexican government surrendered after two years of bloody war and ended after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed, which put an end to the brutal war that had Mexico cede more than half its territory to its neighbor across the north. The 1848 agreement is why places like Utah, New Mexico, California, Nevada, Colorado, Arizona, and some areas in Oklahoma, Wyoming, and Kansas, which were formerly Mexican territory, became parts of the United States. The two-year bloody war left a mark in the history of Mexico and the United States. Although Mexico suffered more casualties in the land tussle, the United States was not fully without issue. In fact, many of the native tribes were affected, especially Native Americans in the Southwest. In today's episode of Native Journal, we discuss the impact of the Mexican-American War on Native communities in the Southwest. As you watch this video, remember to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and turn on the notification bell. Thanks for joining us. Firstly, let's talk briefly about the Mexican-American War. This year, 2024 marks 176 years since the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed, bringing an end to the bloody war and invasion that the United States had waged against Mexico. In the US, that war is barely noticeable, even though it came to characterize the country's cutting-edge southern line alongside the Gadsden Acquisition of 1854. The 1848 agreement effectively ceded over half of Mexico's national territory to its northern neighbor and brought an end to a war that lasted two years. Through the treaty, the US procured quite a bit of what is currently California, Nevada, Utah, New Mexico, Arizona, and Colorado, as well as parts of Oklahoma, Kansas, and Wyoming. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which brought an end to the Mexican-American conflict from 1846 to 1848, was endorsed on February 2, 1848, at Guadalupe Hidalgo, a city north of the capital where the Mexican government had escaped with the development of US powers. By its terms, Mexico surrendered 55% of its territory, including the present-day states of California, Nevada, Utah, New Mexico, the vast majority of Arizona and Colorado, and portions of Oklahoma, Kansas, and Wyoming. In addition, Mexico gave up all of its claims to Texas and recognized the Rio Grande as its southern border with the United States. In September 1847, after its army was defeated and Mexico City, its capital, fell, the Mexican government gave in to the United States and began negotiations to end the war. The Harmony talks were haggled by Nicholas Trist, boss assistant of the State Division, who had gone with General Winfield Scott as a negotiator and President Polk's delegate. Trist and General Scott, after two fruitless endeavors to arrange a settlement with St. Nick Anna, verified that the best way to manage Mexico was as a vanquished foe. Nicholas Trist haggled with an extraordinary commission, addressing the imploded government led by where Bernardo Couto, where Miguel Atristain, and where Luis Gonzaga Cuevas of Mexico. President Polk had reviewed Trist under the conviction that dealings would be completed with a Mexican designation in Washington. In the month and a half it took to convey Polk's message, Trist had gotten word that the Mexican government had named its unique bonus to arrange. Against the precedent's review, Trist discovered that Washington didn't figure out the circumstances in Mexico and arranged the ceasefire in resistance to the president. In a December 4, 1847 letter he stated, realizing that it will generally be the absolute last possibility and dazzled with the shocking results for our country, which can't neglect to go to the deficiency of that opportunity. I chose today around early afternoon to endeavor to make a settlement. The decision is entirely mine. Overlooking the president's review order with the full information that his disobedience would cost him his vocation, Trist decided to stick to his own standards and arrange a settlement infringing upon his directions. His stand made him momentarily an exceptionally dubious figure in the US. Upper California and New Mexico were ceded by Mexico to the United States in accordance with the terms of the treaty that Trist negotiated. This was known as the Mexican Cession, and it included parts of Utah, Nevada and Colorado, as well as Arizona and New Mexico today. Mexico likewise surrendered all cases to Texas and perceived the Rio Grande as the southern limit of the US. The US paid Mexico $15 million, in light of the augmentation obtained by the limits of the US and consented to pay American residents' obligations owed to them by the Mexican government. 
Different arrangements included the security of property and social equality of Mexican nationals living inside the new limits of the US, the commitment of the US to police its limits, and the mandatory assertion of future debates between the two nations. Trist sent a duplicate to Washington by the quickest means possible, compelling Polk to choose whether or not to disavow the profoundly good workmanship of his ruined subordinate. Polk made the decision to submit the treaty to the Senate, at the point when the Senate hesitantly confirmed the settlement by a vote of 34 to 14, ensuring the insurance of Mexican land awards. Following the sanction, U.S. troops were taken out of the Mexican capital. The U.S. government appointed Commissioner Colonel John Weller, Surveyor Andrew Gray, and General Pedro Conde and Sr. to carry out the treaty. José Ilaregui was delegated by the Mexicans to study and define the limit. An ensuing settlement, the Gadsden Bay of December 30, 1853, modified the line from the underlying one by adding 47 more limit markers to the first six. Of the 53 markers, the larger part were impolite heaps of stones, a couple were of solid people with legitimate engravings. As time went on, it became hard to decide the specific area of the markers, with the two nations guaranteeing the firsts had been moved or annihilated. In the 1880s, the two nations reached a convention to resolve the issue, and a survey proved that the boundary needed to be delineated. The Global Limit Commission was made to move the landmarks and imprint the limit line. A survey photographer was hired by the United States Commissioners to capture various perspectives of each monument the United States section found and erected. The Mexican-American War came to an end when the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed on February 2, 1848, Notwithstanding, as the firearms fell quiet and the men got back, another conflict was blending, one that keeps on moulding the course of this country right up to the present day. Although Ulysses S. Grant argued that the Mexican-American War was a wicked war rooted in imperialism and the expansion of slavery, and that the Civil War was God's punishment for it, many Americans supported the Mexican-American War because they saw it as the fulfilment of Manifest Destiny the assurance that sea to shining sea would be covered by the United States. While inevitable success remains a center of US public personality, during the 1840s it energized a huge number of philosophical discussions over this possible new domain, explicitly on the off chance that the region ought to be free or subjugated. The Louisiana Purchase caused a significant emergency regarding the association of new states, which Congress at last settled with the Missouri split perhaps the greatest split in history. It means quite a bit to take note that the discussions in 1820 were to a great extent split among partisan loyalties. For example, leftists versus Whigs. In any case, the Mexican-American conflict resumed past injuries and sent the US into another authoritative emergency. Indeed, even before the conflict was won and the region had been surrendered, Congress was at that point examining how to sort out any potential new area acquired as restitution from Mexico. One of the most significant recommendations was the Wilmot Stipulation, which Agent David Wilmot of Pennsylvania proposed in 1846, two years before the conflict finished. Under this stipulation, any region acquired by battle with Mexico ought to be free, and hence held solely for whites. Wilmot was a free soiler, which implied that he would rather not nullify bondage in the spots where it right now exists, but instead forestall its development to new domains. However, Wilmot was also a Northern Democrat, and the majority of Democrats, even though they did not own slaves, were in favor of and protected slavery. The slave power conspiracy was a conspiracy theory that many Northern Whigs held. According to this theory, even though slave owners were a minority group, the slave power ruled the country's political system through a coalition with doe-faced Democrats, Northern Democrats who supported and protected slavery. While the Wilmot stipulation flopped in the Senate, it passed in the House of Delegates as a result of an alliance between Northern leftists and Northern Whigs and delineated the primary shift from party coalitions to sectional collusions. Resentment over the Wilmot stipulation joined Southerners against Northern dangers in their most significant organization, bondage. The political landscape of the antebellum era was forever altered by this vote. The disappointment of the Wilmot stipulation just put off the issue of servitude for such a long time. Mexico gave over 525,000 square miles of territory to the United States in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in exchange for $15 million, 
and the assumption of Mexican debts to Americans, reviving the issue of slavery. To advance party reliability without exasperating sectional pressures, the Whigs did exclude explicit goals of servitude in their authority stage for the appointment of 1848. The leftists ran on a famous power, which is the possibility that the situation with a domain is not entirely settled by individuals living in that region. Famous power is neither unequivocally favorable to subjugation nor abolitionist subjection. Nonetheless, it invalidates the Missouri split. None of the parties took a firm position on bondage in the 1848 political decision. Be that as it may, the Free Soilers made the political decision about subjugation. Thus, the Whigs and the Liberals created crusade materials to be sectionally appropriated, which featured their competitors' help and resistance to servitude separately. The different mission materials in this political race uncover the developing sectional gap in pre-war America. Zachary Taylor, a slave-owning Whig and hero of the Mexican-American War, was elected president in 1848 and served for two years before passing away of natural causes in office. This was despite the growing sectionalism. Taylor was able to be elected in 1848 thanks to the Mexican-American War, which elevated him to a position of fame. After his political race, Taylor vowed not to mediate with Congress's choice for the association of the Mexican Cession. Numerous Southerners felt deceived by Taylor, a slave owner from Louisiana, as they compared his situation with that of a free soiler. In this season of uplifted sectional strains, that's what Southerners trusted. If one didn't effectively safeguard subjection and its extension, one upheld cancellation. The California Gold Rush began in 1849 as a direct result of the Mexican Cession. This caused a huge frenzy to organize and include California in the Union. The Missouri Compromise expressed that any area north of the 36 degree 30s equal would be free. Nonetheless, the line would separate California into two areas. California was never a U.S. domain, supported a free constitution, chose a lead representative and governing body, and applied for statehood by November 1849. Since California didn't wish to be isolated into two separate expresses, another trade-off was framed, suitably named the split the difference of 1850. Under the split of 1850, California was conceded as a free state without determining the destiny of the rest of the Mexican session. Moreover, under this split, there was a government presumption of Texas obligation, the abolishment of the slave exchange in the region of Colombia, and a more grounded criminal slave regulation. While questionable, the Split the Difference Act of 1850 eased the developing strains over bondage and postponed an out-and-out -out emergency regarding the issue. Again, in 1854, pressures over subjugation soared over the association of Kansas and Nebraska. While Kansas and Nebraska were not part of the Mexican session, their discussions over their association are connected to the Mexican-American War. As previously stated, popular sovereignty was one of the options suggested as a way to organize territory after the Mexican-American War. The Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 brought the Compromise of 1850 in which popular sovereignty was included in the organization of Kansas and Nebraska, back into existence. As a result of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, there was a period known as Bleeding Kansas, in which both pro- and anti-slavery Americans flocked to Kansas to establish either a free or slave government in the state. This eventually led to violence, with one neighbor killing another in the name of abolition and slavery. Draining Kansas is additionally the primary occurrence where John Brown, well known for his 1859 assault on Harper's ship, utilized savagery to order his extreme nullification vision. Besides, the Kansas-Nebraska Act impelled future President Abraham Lincoln into the public spotlight. The Kansas-Nebraska Act was Congressperson Stephen Douglas of Illinois's pet venture, and his well-known power is frequently connected with Douglas. In 1858, Lincoln and Douglas had a series of debates about popular sovereignty and the spread of slavery. While Lincoln lost the senatorial political decision in 1858 to Douglas, he turned out to be notable due to the discussions which positioned him as the conservative contender for the official appointment of 1860. Moreover, the Kansas-Nebraska Act was the last nail in the final resting place for the Whig Party and made ready for the foundation of the Conservative Association, the main noticeable abolitionist servitude party that established sectionalism. Ralph Waldo Emerson prophetically expressed, Mexico will harm us. Slavery debates were rekindled during the Mexican-American War, which resulted in a decrease in party alliances and an increase in sectional alliances. These discussions over subjection ultimately prompted the death of the Second Party Framework, 
and made way for the ascent of republicanism. Sectional strains had never been more grounded and there were open conversations about divergence that expanded as the 1850s advanced. This multitude of pressures and issues would come to an end with the appointment of 1860 and in the long run with the nationwide conflict where siblings battled against siblings. To say Mexico harmed, the US is putting it mildly. The carnage during the nationwide conflict equaled some other American struggle and today we are still during the time spent mending wounds that happened quite a while back. The war and the peace treaty that ended, it helped the United States become a continental power that extended from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Today, the politics surrounding the country's southern border are still influenced by the war. Although the conflict and its result are key to the accounts of both the US and Mexico, they are recollected in emphatically various ways. In Mexican grade schools, youngsters learn of the conflict as La Intervención Estadounidense, or the US mediation, and it is a wellspring of much patriot hatred. In contrast, the war is hardly remembered by the general public in the United States. The California dash for unheard of wealth and the culmination of the cross-country railroad hang out in US narratives of the West extension, and they are treated as normal and unavoidable, as opposed to occasions made conceivable by a conflict of hostility. Regardless of the meaningful contrasts in the manner in which the two nations recollect the arrangement, these public stories are both outlined in enthusiastic terms, whether as survivors of an unfair conflict or inheritors of inevitable success. As individuals in the US keep on discussing how to show its set of experiences, it is extremely important that we move past these patriot accounts and, on second thought, think about the war and treaty according to the point of view of the first occupants of this territory. When we look at the settlement from a native viewpoint, we see striking equals between the two fighting nations. Both wanted to seize native lands, held racist views of native people, and were willing to use the law and genocidal violence to accomplish their goals. In 1848, the US and Mexico were somewhat youthful countries, achieving their autonomy in 1776 and 1821, respectively. Also, despite their authoritative way of talking, Neither country completely broke with the rationale of the frontier powers from which they were born. The two countries acquired philosophies of a racial progressive system and matchless quality, a craving for local land and the act of property subjection. The two state-run administrations battled, because of the ingenuity of strong native countries, to force their standard on the grounds and individuals of what is presently the US Southwestern Territory of California. The land the US procured through the deal had been essential for pioneering New Spain and afterward Mexico in 1821. The Spanish and resulting Mexican states battled to control what comprised the northernmost outskirts of their domain. The incomparable Pueblo Revolt of 1680 is only one illustration of via the native difficulties in pioneering ruler. Upon gaining autonomy, the new Mexican government trumpeted conservative goals of freedom and balance, yet these were regularly betrayed local people groups aggregate land privileges for the sake of private property. And keeping in mind that specialists logically gave proper respect to the old Aztec progress, they advanced arrangements of absorption and the education of Spanish to the disservice of Native Americans. Even though federal officials had formal authority over the land, powerful Native American tribes like the Kiowa, Pueblo, Apache, Comanche, Yaqui and Diné continued to run their affairs benefiting from their distance from Mexico City and the legacy of the Spanish Republica de Indios system, a colonial policy that allowed for some forms of indigenous self-governance. While the new government officially moved to abolish subjugation in 1829, the training endured, especially in the northern peripheries, entangling both African-dropped and local groups. The natives confronted provincial infringement from the south, yet additionally from the east. Comanche and other Native American lands were invaded by the movement for Texas independence in the middle of the 1830s. This was a settler project that wanted to keep slavery and increase American power. Consequently, by the mid-1840s, local countries defied threatening provincial powers in pretty much every bearing. Comanches, Kiowas and Apaches increasingly chose to attack Mexican settlements on native land rather than negotiate with Mexican authorities. Across what was then northern Mexico, native marauders drove and facilitated assaults on Mexican towns, in what historian Brian de Ferrell has depicted as a battle of 1,000 deserts. The after effect of compelling native attacks was the formation of deserts, which deserted and obliterated settlements. 
Mexican specialists reproved the aggressors as Indios Barbaros, an appellation that US specialists completely concurred with. Looking back, the viability of Native Americans striking Mexican settlements put the Mexican central government in a much more vulnerable situation in 1846, when the US declared war. Regardless, the US mediation was surprisingly lengthy. After advancing far into Mexican territory, bombing civilian areas in the port city of Veracruz and occupying Mexico City, the United States was able to declare victory. With the signing of the deal, these native grounds turned out to be officially essential for the US region. However, numerous local groups kept on going after settlements on the two sides of the new US-Mexican boundary. Article 11 of the deal, which ordered that the US government be committed to shielding a Mexican area from savage clans, is a demonstration of the ingenuity of this native power. In what is today Arizona and New Mexico, the settlement decreased the independence of numerous local countries. Maurice Crandall, a Yavapai Apache historian, noted that the United States had never considered Indians as citizens in 1848. Native Americans fought for US citizenship or other forms of legally protected status in order to maintain local control under this new colonial administration. The natives had an undecided perspective on citizenship and appointive legislative issues. Some pushed for citizenship as a technique of local area strengthening, others shunned it as one more type of oppression into a pilgrim project. In California, the established show immediately moved to deny local individuals the option to cast a ballot. What's more, during the gold rush, Native American groups experienced degrees of state-endorsed pioneer brutality that moved toward destruction. Although the Guadalupe Hidalgo Treaty provided assurances to former Mexican residents now residing in the US, Native and others struggled for years to have their property rights and languages recognized. California authorized charges on unfamiliar excavators, which designated Spanish-talking occupants, and local people groups progressively wound up denied freedoms to land, citizenship, and schooling in the new US domains. Although the two young nations were not the same, they both used racist, anti-indigenous colonial tactics. In this context, the indigenous people resisted two conflicting colonial agendas, both aiming, at best, for their forced integration into these nations, and, at worst, for their elimination. For quite a long time, and on whichever side of the US-Mexico line they found themselves, local people groups have savagely and imaginatively safeguarded their networks and grounds. That insubordination proceeds, Today, as we think about the tradition of the 1848 settlement and the public boundaries it created, we would do well to consider from what vantage point we portray this set of experiences and its significance. On the off chance that we move past public stories and focus on the narratives of native individuals, these occasions look altogether different. How we recollect this set of experiences is similarly significant as what we recall. Patriotic points of view make it difficult to envision a world without borders and the prejudice and imbalance that they propagate. Thanks for watching. If you find this video interesting and informative, give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more Greek content like this. See you in our next video.